The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 165. Oi! Don't be scared. All of this is new to you and new can be scary. When people need help, I never refuse. There's this moment when you're sure you're about to die, and then you're born. I know exactly who I am. I'm the Doctor. Ta-da! Ooh. Should be fine. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the latest episode of this current season, called The Haunting of Villa Diodati. Joining me today on the panel is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So sadly, Father Corey couldn't be with us this week. Uh, he's under the weather. He may be uh, hidden as the guardian in the basement of his rectory, <laughs> or he's just has the cold. So uh, we, we do wish Father Corey well and hope he gets better soon. And I'm sure he'll yeah. be back with us next time. So, folks, if you can, what we do have a favor to ask of you. If you are enjoying the podcast, and I hope you are if you're listening, pl- please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from and write a review for us and then share the podcast with your friends. That all helps us grow the community of listeners and grow the podcast, uh, which we we hope, you know, if you're enjoying that, you want others to enjoy it as well. And a larger audience makes the podcast better. They even make it easy to share these days. All you have to do is hit one of those share buttons. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, let's talk about this latest episode, The Haunting of Villa Diodati. Um, uh, right off the top, uh, my uh, I want to say that it, uh, I, it surprised me. It surprised me not just by the content, but also by the quality. And we can get into that as we go. It reminded me also a bit of our recent episode where we talked about the Big Finish audio production called The Chimes of Midnight. Uh, I'm sure Mm -hmm. you can see the similarities of well, where a house comes alive and is is, has filled with evil and things like that. So I just I thought that was very interesting right off the top. I just wanted to, to, to throw that out there. I, as I mentioned last week, I was excited for this episode because I already knew about the setting. Uh, mm-hmm. For people who may not have heard last episode, the uh, 1816 is a very famous year that um, is known as the year without a summer or yeah. 1800 and froze to death <laughs> because it the previous year, Mount Tambor in the Pacific expl- you know, bl- had a major eruption that caused a brief volcanic winter. The, it's like an atomic winter. There's so much volcanic ash and dust in the atmosphere that it blocks sunlight. And so 1816 was a really cold, wet, rainy year. And that's why Shelley and uh, Mary and Byron and everybody were holed up in this villa at Lake Geneva in Switzerland, taking shelter from the weather and passing, uh, telling ghost stories to pass the time. And that led to the first modern vampire story, not Dracula, but the vampire by uh, Byron's physician Polidori. Mm-hmm. And also it led to Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, the modern or postmodern Prometheus. And so I was all excited about that. Um, Of course, it does cause some some continuity issues in that in Big Finish, Mary Shelley has been a companion of the Eighth Doctor. And if you go back to the Eighth Doctor, Paul McGann's TV movie, I mean, it's very heavily patterned on Frankenstein, his regeneration. Right. And so he already is a kind of Frankenstein figure. And so it was natural to have Mary Shelley as an Eighth Doctor companion. But since they explicitly note that the Siberium in this episode was sent back in time to change history... You can explain all that. That's the fun <laughs> thing about Doctor Who. Is right. up, yeah, he, she, Mary Shelley was the Doctor's companion in one timeline. Right. That's right. Because yeah, because they really address that. In fact, they really address the problems of this that this event causes them. And I love the fact that like the Cybermen have always been, you know, from their beginning, somewhat related to Frankenstein. They're this, mm-hmm. the body horror. The human body altered and turned into a, a, me- a mechanism in a way uh, like Frankenstein was and, you know, stripped of its normal human functions. And so to really, 
unite those. We'll, and uh, you know, I'm leaping ahead a little bit, but we'll talk about it again. But to unite those with actual Mary Shelley and the inspiration for the book Frankenstein is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's talk about okay the 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 people apart from the 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 fam that we're t- that we're dealing with here. We have Lord Byron, who mm-hmm. is a, a famous poet, uh, who is known to be somewhat of a uh, of a, a a player, as we might yeah. say, or dissipated, or yeah, <laughs> yes. all of these people are kind of dissipated. Right. It was a bit. It was the romantic quote unquote era where this was sort of known. It was the sixties of the eighteen hundreds, just shall we say. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we have uh, Mary Shelley. Uh, Percy who, who isn't yeah. yet married to Percy Shelley, but they're is they're planning to get married and they're already passing themselves off as husband and wife. Right, which you would do in the era in order to travel and stay together without scandal, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have Percy Shelley, the, the, the poet, and you have uh, Paul, Dr. John Polidori, who uh, I hadn't known before, but as you mentioned, wrote mm-hmm. the one of the, the first vampire novels. Uh, and then... Yeah, I, I've read that one, by the way. Okay. Uh, and then Mary it's like Godwin... like a short story. Yeah, Mary Godwin was, I I think I missed that. She was related to, uh, Mary Shelley. I mean, um, uh, Shelley was she married? Uh, she's the she's the one I know least about. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Um. Yeah. There was there there was this third one who's like someone's stepsister or something like that. And we'll we'll get we'll it probably will come up as we go through it. But um. So that's the those are the people that they encounter from that time period. So, uh. They're they're in the this house, the Villa Diodati, which you told us last week uh, means, means gift of the Diodati means given by God or gift of God. So this is the Villa gift of God, and uh, it's it's a rainy, thundering night, of course, uh, because on TV whenever it rains it thunders. It's just <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night, yeah. and so Byron to, to, to bend a line from Edward Bulwer Lytton. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so Byron is reading from this book, Tales of the Dead, as the maid is taking uh, uh, the baby, uh, Mary Shelley's baby, to uh, to its bedroom to put him down for the night. And then we hit, we see a doorknob being jiggled. Um, we see a vase fly across the wall and crash. Uh, you know, we see these weird things happening. And then we see women, a uh, older lady and a young girl who are there and then they're not there. We see a kind of shadowy figure in flashes of lightning who's transparent. Yes. Yep. Lots of weird stuff. So hunting sort of things. Uh, someone and then someone bangs at the front door at this tense moment in the reading and they, they all go to to see who it is. And they open the door and everybody screams and it's the doctor and companions uh, standing in the rain asking to be let in. Um, I had a similar experience once in the rain. It yeah. was a dark and stormy night. I came <laughs> home. I got out of my truck. I was going, getting, you know, opening the door to my house. And there was this neighborhood cat that for cats was extraordinarily bold. Uh huh. I mean, it would show up. It would march into your house. It knew you were going in. It was coming in with you. It was incredibly fearless for a cat. <laughs> I mean, total strangers. It's never met you. It's never, but it's coming into your house. And I looked down at my feet and there was this cat there trying to get into my house on the dark and stormy night. And I looked at it and it looked at me and we weren't expecting it. And we both screamed at each other. (laughs) And I then realized, oh, this is an evolutionary response. If you're in an emergency situation, you open your mouth, make a loud noise and show your teeth. (laughs) <laughs> and so for both of our species, that ah, has an evolutionary function that signals you may be about to attack. Right. <laughs> That's great. So uh, they 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 are invited in. Uh, the, the, and Graham starts to quote Jane Austen uh, at this point. It is a truth universally acknowledged. And the doctor stops him. From Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> wrong. <laughs> wrong things. He criticizes her for parking the TARDIS too far from the door in the rain, which I, I thought was An hour fun. away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, she tries to use the psychic paper to kind of trick uh, the, you know, Byron and the Shelleys and whatnot, uh, or Mary Shelley at this point, uh, which it doesn't work. And I think she says something about it. Maybe it's wet or something. Or... Yeah, maybe it needs a blow dry. <laughs> uh, apparently, though, I, I've seen I haven't really 
check this out, but I've seen other commentators, not on this episode, but I've seen commentators recently noting that the psychic paper doesn't work for Jodie Whittaker's doctor as effortlessly as it does for other recent doctors. Mm. And so that may be a deliberate choice on their part. If so, it's an interesting choice because she is the most psychic of all doctors so far. <laughs> yes, as we'll I mean, see. <laughs> she telepaths it twice in this episode. Right, right. Uh, so she mentions that they're here because this is the night that inspired Frankenstein, the, the writing of the book Frankenstein, and they want to witness this happen. Uh, but, but there are strict rules. Yeah. Do not, do not mention Frankenstein. Do not uh, do something else. And nobody snog Byron. <laughs> right, that's, that's the big one. Now, it's very interesting that how strict she is about this don't oh, interfere. Snog, and snog means kiss for Americans. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting that um, uh, that how strict she is with don't inspire the writers because of how fast and loose they've played with this in the past with Shakespeare right. and other and Van Gogh and other uh, creatives that they've encountered in history where the doctors const or the companions are constantly providing, you know, the, the inspiration for their famous works and stuff. So I'm kind of glad that they move away from that a little bit here. Uh, mm -hmm. Although e even though the events of the night are intended to have inspired both the writing of the book, Frankenstein and uh, a poem by Byron that we'll hear at the end. Uh, so it would take that as, but it's not like a direct, like, here's a line. It's not the doctor and companions directly causing it, wink, right. wink, ha ha, look how clever we are. Right. We're causing a bootstrap paradox. Right, exactly. So um, we're told that Byron is uh, separated from his wife and taking up with Mary Shelley's stepsister, Claire. Uh, that's who she is. And uh, Mary is calling herself Mrs. Shelley, even though they aren't married. So we have, you know, oh, the gossip and, you know, the, the inappropriateness. And we're, we're... and then uh, the doctor tries to get them into this situation where they begin to come up with the idea for Frankenstein, except Sh Percy Shelley is missing, even yeah, though he was no, there. No, no. We're not skipping over the dancing. Okay, all right. <laughs> we got to talk about the oh, dancing. I'm sorry, Jimmy. How can I, how can I skip the dancing? All right, let's talk about yeah. the dancing. So they're doing um, an English country dance. And even though they say it's a quadrille and even though they have the right number of people for a quadrille, at least when they show us that the, what looks like the start of the dance, they're not doing a quadrille. They're doing what looks like a long ways duple minor. And it's it's fascinating for me to watch that because I know the moves they're doing. It's like, OK, they're doing forward and back and then they do a hole in the wall crossing and then they face their neighbor and do right shoulder siding. Then they do another hole in the wall crossing. Then the middles do four changes of rights and lefts. And it's like, I want to I want to see this whole dance because <laughs> I want to call it in the future at English country dances. <laughs> um, but they don't let us see the whole dance. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to do further research to see is this an actual dance from history that they had a choreographer bring in or um, otherwise I'll write the missing pieces of the dance myself and call it. That was going to be my question was how authentic was this dance? Like it would, did, did, did it feel like they, they looked into it and they have at least the right moves? Yeah. Well, they, they, these moves certainly exist today. Um, what I don't know is, how all of them in particular, I don't know if a hole in the wall crossing existed at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what a hole in the wall crossing is, is where you change places with the person you're facing and you do it by approaching, pivoting around each other and stepping back. So it's kind of an elegant move where you okay. have that pivot in the middle of it. And um, and they do that twice in this dance. The move is named after a more recent dance called hole in the wall. Um but it's such an elegant move. I have a hard time believing it didn't exist in the, in into well into the past. Right. Um, even if it wasn't called that yet. Also, they have their sighting correct um, in English country dance. Uh, so the first major book of English country dance was published in uh, 1651 by a guy named Playford, and who was a book printer. And in the Complete Dancing Master, which is what it's called, they back then a caller was called a dancing master or dancing instructor. So, and they still use that term at at balls. Like when I've called at local balls, 
um, I'm the dancing master for the day. Um, but uh, in this book, they had dance instructions, and this was what helped popularize English country dance, and one of them was a move called sighting. But Playford did not give definitions for these moves, and so there was a... Um, there there was a dispute in the 20th century about what did some of these old terms mean. And what they could figure out was that, okay, siding is something that involves you and the person you're facing and your sides, and it kills eight beats of music and it leaves you in the place you started. And there was a guy named uh, Pat Shaw who conjectured that siding involved swirling around somebody and coming back to where you started. Um, so you'd like cross by left shoulder and come back by right shoulder as part of the swirl and further historical re so, And so that's known as Shaw siding after, after him. But then there's this other kind of siding that was proposed where you just get your shoulders together and come back. So like you walk forward, you get your right shoulders together, you come back, you walk forward, you get your left shoulders together, you come back. And um, it turns out on further research, that's the actual historical form of sighting, mm. not the other one that got made up in the 20th century. And so they're doing the right kind of sighting in, uh, in, this, in this episode. They're doing shoulder sighting instead of swirl sighting. I'm going to guess that if the director had said, I need them to interact in a certain way, they would have just done you know whatever work but i'm glad it worked out that they needed the way they needed the characters to interact uh coincided with the dance that they the moves that they chose yeah and they also i, mean, I assume they brought in a choreographer or an expert in in dance history to do this for them mm -hmm. um the um but they then at the end of it graham who's uncomfortable with this they're what they're doing is they're uh they're swinging and moving it around in a circle at the same time. They're swinging their partners mm -hmm. and Graham is uncomfortable and wants to duck out and says, I've got to go to the little boy's room, which is, you know, a modern phrase they wouldn't have understood because right. they used chamber pots. They didn't have little boys rooms. Yeah. Um, and, and he leaves, but that's like a cardinal sin in the middle of a dance <laughs> because in a quadrille, the entire dance will break down if somebody leaves. Right. And so you always wait to the end of a dance and then you duck out between dances. Right. But right. then it's like the doctor from looking at it from a dancer's perspective, the doctor then covers for him by ending the dance and saying, well, that was wonderful. Now let's all tell the scariest ghost story ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And that's a funny point about uh, Graham who, in, who ends up wandering around a bit looking for the bathroom uh, until he realizes that they that they hadn't been invented yet, uh, so <laughs> that uh, that that comes yeah. up and it plays into the the reveals of of this. But there's also there's also another problem with that because he when he's complaining about it, he's like he could can't find the toilet, and the butler just or the valet uh, gestures to a chamber pot, and nope, the valet shouldn't know that word because at this time toilet meant your personal grooming, right. Which and, we still use and, for toiletries. Yeah. Yeah. And so it hadn't become connected with a bathroom or a commode yet. And right. so the valet shouldn't have cued in that he wants a chamber pot from the word toilet. Maybe the, the TARDIS translated for, for uh, Graham. Yeah. Dynamic <laughs> equivalence translation, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So you mentioned that the doctor tries to get them to create the, the greatest you know horror story ever, uh, which is Frankenstein. Uh, but she does note that Percy Shelley is missing when he was there historically. Um, we have uh, the, that we switched to Graham walking around, but then we have this uh, the vase, like I said, crashed against the wall. And then a hand, a skeletal hand bursts from a painting that falls from the, the wall, the, floor, um, the wall, uh, which in, in crawls away, which, you know, creepy. <laughs> Very creepy. This so suddenly we're in the crawling hand, which is a 1963 movie. Only it's lost its flesh, which makes it even creepier. Yes. And when it ends up strangling Ryan, I find it more effective. Even though from one perspective it should be less threatening, 
because there are no tendons on this hand to pull it into shape. Yes. Nevertheless, I find it more creepy that it's a skeleton because those bones are going to be hard and they're gripping your neck. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it looks very spider-like, by the way, when it's yeah. when it's just skeleton. Uh, Graham uh, walks up the same stair twice. You know, he goes up and he's and he finds himself back at the beginning again. He, at this point, he doesn't quite realize it. Uh, although there is a maid standing in, in front of a window uh, as he walks by that he doesn't notice. And as the lightning crashes and the light flashes, uh, she disappears. And there's also a little girl behind the door of the of the of the uh, the baby's room as it opens and closes. Uh, and then the the doctor finally tells Byron that she's kind of out of sorts because she senses an unrelenting evil in the house, uh, which is interesting. I'm not sure they, I'm not sure they cl they they close the loop on that. Well, like, what exactly is she sensing here? Is it the the eventually the Cyberman, the house's protection, the the ghosts? That it, it's, the Siberian maybe could be. I oh, know um, it's hard. It's hard to say. Um, and that's another place where we have, but here they, they do it right with the word. She says, I'm getting a weird vibe from this place. Yeah. And nobody before the 1960s would have know what, known what that meant. And so <laughs> right. Byron doesn't know what it means. Yes, that's true. I, I do want to take a moment here to kind of, to stop and, 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 and make a, a couple of things. One thing they, in this episode, they are much more sparing in the exposition in sort mm -hmm. of explaining everything, which I think is good because I think they've gone overboard in exposition in previous episodes this season. Uh, it, it's been pointed out that during the dance, they do a lot of exposition. They do. And, and, but they're masking it by giving us this visual thing to look at. Right. And, and we don't get a lot of it in the, I mean, there's some exposition, but the, the, in fact, in some cases they are a little, they go a little, they, they veer a little toward the too little exposition at, at some points. Yeah. One of my notes is who, which one of these people is who? Yes. Um, because they're dressed enough alike and they look enough alike. It's hard for me to keep, okay, which woman is this? Is this Mary or is this the other woman? And is this Polydori right. or is it Byron or is it Shelley? And if, and it, they start to use names like it's it's uh, not Mary, it's the other lady, but she Claire. turns to yeah. Claire and she says, Dr. Polidori. It's like, okay, now I know who that is. <laughs> right. um, and they should have done that a little more earlier on to help cement these people. Eventually, yeah. when um, when we finally get to Byron, uh, or when we finally get to Shelley at the end, he's got like a different color hair yes. than the other men. And it's like, okay, I can, I can, <laughs> I use can tell that who you are. <laughs> you, despite <laughs> yeah. the fact they're all wearing these you know, early 1800s clothes. Right. Um, of course, the one that was easy the whole time was the valet. Yes. Uh, who who very subtly is like, he's he's like Alfred in some of those uh, Batman movies yes. where Alfred is kind of cynical about all this. <laughs> yeah. And, and the valet is, is kind of cynical about what's going on around him, but he's a good man in a crisis. So the, the, uh, the actor does a good job. I don't know if he was directed to do this or if he just did this on his own, but there are plenty of times where like someone says something to him and he, and he goes to do this thing, but you can see him as he walks off, like roll his eyes or look yeah, sort of like sigh. <laughs> yes. Cause, cause he's, 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 dealing i mean it's his job to serve these young wastrels who are all young idiots <laughs> yeah. and and very pretentious and stuff and and he's got to implement their will and right. so of course he's thinking that stuff <laughs> so, that, he was very good uh the other thing i, I should i want to note like in general is um as as we've complained <laughs> throughout the, the the season uh as americans we're having we, we have some trouble picking up the northern accents it's just the way it is but then when you combine it with um the the accent and then the cyberman like uh, vo voice, voice manipulation yeah. and uh, there were times when i had to rewind several times to figure out what was being said it was uh it was it was it was a little difficult at times but i think i i got most of it but, I had to uh, check closed captioning and because yeah. there's one point where the doctor tells Byron, you and me need to have a skiz on the skeleton in your room or <laughs> something like that. It's like, yeah. here's a term that you don't encounter every day. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So back to the, to the events of what's going on. And so uh, at this point, Polidori challenges Ryan to a duel. Ryan had been playing chopsticks on the piano uh, for Mary Shelley, who's, who's a, uh, 
uh, uh, enamored of it because no one's heard Chop Six before. And Polidori is just angry that uh, Ryan is mo- uh, monopolizing Mary's time or something. I don't know. Um, well, he's al- he, they also explain that he is um, an insomniac, so yes. he's out of sorts. And he furthermore gets Ryan insults him. I mean, it's right. subtle by modern standards, but not subtle in an honor culture. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, so uh, he challenges Ryan to do uh, and, and But that's interrupted by the hand coming in and, as you mentioned, choking Ryan, uh, which they, they eventually stop. I love the fact that uh, the doctor pulls it. I think it's the doctor pulls it from Ryan's throat and throws it across the room where the, the valet hammers it, it. <laughs> with, yeah. the, with the silver tray <laughs> to the ground i'm like nice Pulver- shot <laughs> pulverizes it yeah that's an awesome moment <laughs> that was really good um we should mention about dueling because this was a real thing yeah. um and it was a big problem uh at the time you would because in at least in british and american and scottish circles you had this honor culture where your you had to protect your reputation Mm-hmm. You know, your reputation was something that enabled you to function in society in a much bigger way than is required now. Um, I mean, it, it was essential you protect your reputation or your honor. And so if someone, you know, tr- tried to deprive you of honor, you had to defend it vigorously. And that led to dueling. And this was, it was more, even more broad in Europe, but I know for a fact it was big in like Scotland and England and America at the time. Right. And um, there were rules about dueling. You notice uh, Polidori uh, grabs the valet to be his second and yeah. wants Graham to be Ryan's second. Um, and the church, int- very interestingly, there's this question because these duels, you know, tended to be to the death. So do you have a priest on hand Mm -hmm. to uh, administer last rites to someone who's mortally wounded? And in various uh, eras in history, the church said, no, no, this is just is so bad. You cannot just casually take human life like this over your honor and to discourage uh, people from dueling. We will not provide a priest. Right. Uh, so you will die unshriven, unannealed if right. you engage in this activity. Yeah. I mean, anyone who who's a fan of Hamilton or knows the story of Alexander Hamilton knows famously that about the duels that Hamilton encountered. And and Polidori here is he's he he apparently, you know, that is someone who likes to duel. You know, he he is uh, or at least is experienced enough with it that he's ready to go to get, to go up to his room and get his his dueling pistol. Uh, whether Ryan uh, arms himself or not, so it's a uh, it's it's interesting to see it. Uh, so he's so readily here, uh, but of course, as we said, the hand interrupts, and uh, you know, talk to the hand, talk to the hand. <laughs> I, knew, I was trying to get that out, <laughs> and uh, they uh, they they turns out that Byron has a collection of war relics, uh, including the skeleton of a 15th century soldier from a battle that I didn't catch the name of it of, uh, but some Napoleonic battle, no. 15th mm-hmm. century would be pretty, yeah, would not be the religion. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Byron does make a comment that he's starting to think that the doctor is not from where they think she's from. She's from somewhere much stranger. The North, perhaps. <laughs> Which yeah. I thought was, <laughs> that was, that was a good line. Um, I'm still amazed. And I, I would, I, I may check this out at some point. I wouldn't be surprised that Byron would have this skeleton but it's so creepy. And, <laughs> you know, his his argument is this is a memento mori. A memento mori is something you keep around to remind yourself of death. And it frequently could be something like a skull. Yes. That, you know, a, a real skull of a human being. But having a whole skeleton as yeah. a memento mori is a little unusual, it mm. seems to me, um, and quite gruesome. And he also has the the helmet with yes. the plume that the soldier wore, and the doctor immediately takes a shine to the helmet and starts wearing it. <laughs> yeah. And this is like a hark back to Patrick Troughton's doctor who had a hat fixation, mm-hmm. and the doctor is immediately asking people whether it, you know, whether it looks good on her. And later on, she says... Uh, She'll probably come back and and look at the uh, at at the hat again, 
um, just for historical reasons, not that it suits me or anything. <laughs> yeah. And she's like clearly angling to be given the hat as a gift. Right. That's right. <laughs> which then does not happen. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, they get distracted. Uh, but uh, they, they're told that uh, Percy Shelley isn't there because he's indisposed at the chalet that he shares with Mary on the grounds of the estate, you know, uh, because he saw an apparition over the lake. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the explanation for why he's not, not there. We'll, uh, we'll begin to understand more about that as we go on. Uh, meanwhile, everyone's going in circles. They can't, you know, wa- get anywhere because every time they leave the room, they come back through the same door. Something is preventing them from leaving spaces, uh, except so Polidori. Now we're, now we're in, he built a crooked house. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, my uh, my wife Melanie mentioned uh, that it sounds like the haunting of Hill House, which is a, a famous ghost mm. story, which is perhaps the uh, uh, the inspiration for the title of this one, the haunting of Villa Diodati. But uh, but Polidori uh, sleepwalks. We've been told Polidori has insomnia, but here he he has fallen asleep. Oh, and I should mention he falls asleep, and Graham is supposed to be watching him, um, and then he notices a maid and a young girl who have brought him some food and he starts mm-hmm. talking to them, but they seem really creepy. <laughs> These are the and people who disappeared earlier. All. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's when Polidori arises. He's not awake. He's sleepwalking apparently and walks through a wall uh, and ends up in the the room upstairs where the doctor is with uh, uh, Shelley, uh, Mary Shelley and uh, Byron. And the doctor realizes they're experiencing some kind of perception filter. Uh, mm-hmm. So they um, they ex- um, have to close their eyes and tell themselves Feel their environment because yes. it's apparently it's a visual perception filter, not a tactile perception filter. Right. So like at one point, the doctor tries to walk out of the house into an open space and smacks her head on an invisible wall. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, and then uh, Mary Shelley finally is able to be, because she, she you know closes her eye to the perception filter is finally able to get to her son's room because she'd heard him crying. Uh, but when she gets there, um, she only There's finds... a skull and a hand, and, and skeletal hand in the in the crib. It's yes. like, that's... And this, I had a, in my notes here, you know, the crying baby and uh, inability to get to him and the lightning flashes. This is really effectively creepy and scary. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Melanie says at this point, they better not hurt the baby. <laughs> like, if they, uh-huh. if the baby gets hurt... I'm out of here. <laughs> it's yeah. very clear well, on that. You, you, this is a family show. There's no way they're going to permanently hurt a baby. Which is, yeah, it, which is what I said. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the well, doctor. Also, we, we get yeah. another bit of linguistic stuff where the TARDIS clearly is not giving dynamic equivalence uh, translations right. because uh, Graham says that uh, Polidori has become a zombie. Yes. And so Byron does not know the term zombie as he wouldn't because right. that term did not enter mainstream English vocabulary until like the 1930s or I think actually 1940s with the film White Zombie starring Bela Lugosi. Right, right. Uh, at that, this point, it would be restricted to the Caribbean and, and yeah. certain and, uh, slave cultures. Uh, pigeon, pigeon languages. Yes. Not normal English. Right. Uh, so the doctor determines that what what they have here is, is a time travel. They, sh- they see the apparition outside, approaching the house. And she realizes the house is some kind of security system that's designed to protect something, um, and it's a time traveler trying to push its way through time. And oh. it, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. By the way, I, I wanted to note one of the ways they save special on special effects money in this. Mm-hmm. They shoot this looping house sequence really interestingly. Yeah. And they'll, some of it is just done with camera, stopping the camera. Right. Um, you know, they, they do sometimes use CGI to show things looping, but it's not like somebody opens a door and we see an infinite regress of the same room. Right. Which they could have done, but they don't. Um, instead, for most of the time, they keep the budget really simple by just focusing on, okay, here are these two characters. Mary Shelley runs up to find her baby, and then she's coming up from below them on the right. staircase now. And I think the simplest version of it, but it's still effective, is in the room where uh, Byron has his skeleton and the doctor is trying to walk out into another room. And all she does is walk off stage right and walk back in 
from stage right. And yeah. she just keeps going off to the right, back from the right, off to the right, back from the right. Yeah. It, thus communicating, even though we never see it, that she's, as soon as she walks through the door, she's back in the same room. Yeah. So the door is like a mirror that just turns her around. It's an effective low tech uh, that is sort of a throwback in, in one way. It gives this the whole episode that feel a bit of classic uh, uh, thriller, you know, horror movie, Saturday afternoon, scary movie of the week, too. I think it's effective, not just as a money saver, but also just as a dramatic piece. Um, so, yeah, so the time traveler, we, she determines a time traveler. Then it, it turns out she sees him. It's the lone, it's a lone Cyberman. And as she explains it, organs, flesh, surgically replaced with mechanical parts without his consent. And you see, and we focus on Mary Shelley and we say, hey, that sounds a lot like <laughs> Frankenstein's monster. Uh, up to a point, Lord Copper. There are no <laughs> mechanical parts right. in Frankenstein. Real Frankenstein's monster, really. Right. No, and I, I get. The, yeah, my wife pointed out the same thing. But, but, but I think what they're implying is that the Cyberman becomes that inspiration for right. you know, the, this oh, yeah. idea of a con, of a c constructed man. And and they even bring it out more fully later when Mary is talking to the Cyberman mm -hmm. and he's the, you can see part of him is human because right. his, he's apparently not finished all the way or he had part of his casing blown off of him or something. And he's got scars all over him. And she actually asks, are you multiple men? Right. And so she's clearly got the idea there. Oh, and by the way, we should note, uh, yes, there are electrodes in the universal horror Frankenstein pictures, and those are mechanical parts. Those are not in the book. Ah, very good point. Good point. So, yeah, he's he's a unf an unfinished Cyberman, unfinished in being changed. He has uh, lots of emotion. So he's not he's not the emotionless machine that they eventually become. Um and, yeah, and that's really strange. And yeah. we need more. He doesn't have an emotion inhibitor, but he's also not killing himself. And he's still sold on the Cyberman cause. It's that's I want to understand this Cyberman more. I hope we come I hope we yeah. come back to him. And uh the the doctor is going to go chase him down, but she won't let them go anyone go with her. She won't let the, the fam help her. Because she says, we, I won't let them take someone else. And I felt like that was a callback to oh, Cyber yeah. Bill and Cyber um, Danny and that sort of stuff. That all the people she's lost to the Cybermen. Uh, yeah, so, she, she says, I will not lose anyone else to that. Yeah. Clearly referring to Bill. And it's it's a good moment where the it, she feels like the uh, the continuity of all the doctors at this point. And, and mm -hmm. I want to say... Uh, I, I uh, I'll hold my my like overall judgment till the end, I guess. But uh, but th that was a significant moment for me. So the uh, the Cyberman's stomping around looking for the Guardian. You know, uh, he attacks a valet and at, you know picks him up by the throat. And are you the Guardian? And he says no. And uh, I'm the valet. I'm the valet. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't need a valet. And he throws him down. And then uh, we we have. Uh, uh, I was, I was waiting for someone to go. Are you my mummy? <laughs> Back and forth, but uh, mm -hmm. they, no, they don't. And then uh, he the, he ends up he, in the baby's room, and the baby is crying. And yeah. the baby's nurse, who is French, is hidden in a trunk with the baby, trying to keep the baby quiet. And this yeah. is like a terrifying moment that you I've right. seen parallels to in other fiction, where the crying baby is going to give everybody away, and we're all going to die if the baby doesn't yeah. stop crying. What do you do? Yes. And in some depictions of this type of scene, the baby has been smothered. Yes. And that's not going to happen on Doctor Who. <laughs> no. So that means that um, the uh, Cyberman wrenches up the lid to the trunk and kills the uh, the maid by snapping her neck off screen mm -hmm. and takes the baby and the baby is crying and you have this Cyberman and the Cyberman, who is really effective body horror here with being able to see his face yes. more than we have ever seen the face of a Cyberman before. Um, I mean, sometimes we've seen the chin yeah. or stuff like that. Sometimes we've seen the contours of the face through a stocking. But here we're seeing basically half of this guy's face uh, yes. on one side. And so he's, he's he picks up the baby. He's just killed the nurse. 
there's like rust or blood or something on his outer sheath. And he says to the baby, don't be afraid, little one. And you're hopeful for a second. And then he says, you will be like us. <laughs> <laughs> you will be assimilated. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it, this is yeah. really effectively creepy with the body horror and the Cyberman and the the crying baby and everything here is really creepy. Yeah, it's interesting how much it, he looks because you can see his face. He looks like the Borg of Star Trek. There's that that there's always been uh -huh. that comparison, but you know, even more so here but with emotion. Yes, which the Borg don't have is he's like. Yeah. This guy is just convinced of the cyber cause, but he's got emotions. Well, except for the Borg Queen, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So the the doctor eventually... Uh, oh, the Borg Queen is all flirty, and this guy is not flirty. Yeah, there's no flirty here. The doctor uh, encounters him and challenges him, you know, uh, confronts him, while the others have gone off looking for the baby, William, and... Yeah, Yaz gets a really great moment of agency here because the doctor has forbidden them to follow her mm -hmm. and Yaz is like, we've got to do something. And Ryan is like, but she said, don't follow her. And she said, we couldn't do anything. We need to stay here. And Yaz is like, technically, she said, we coun't follow her. Let's split up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so it's like, yay, Yaz developing agency as a character. I like. Right, right. And then they end up in with this one room where they find writing all over the wall. Uh, and uh, yeah, this they, is Shelley's room. Yes. And they recognize the handwriting as being Percy Shelley's. And uh, although the writing itself uh, is in an alien script and we find out that the Cyberman is looking for the Siberium. Uh, did we know what Siberium was before this no, point? OK, this is new. All right. So and then we he the, the Cyberman starts quoting a Shelley poem called Queen Mab, and uh, the others hear him through the fireplace, I guess. He, they, they, he's uh, awfully loud. Yeah, well, that's what they think, but they're really all standing in the same room. They're just not perceiving it. Oh, right, right. That's that's true. And uh, so he quotes this the part, bits of Shelley from the, that, that are appropriate to the, uh, <laughs> the moment, apparently. And uh, Graham, meanwhile, is down in the basement with Claire and Polidori, uh, looking for a way out, which the coal shuttle is gone. And they, they find Percy Shelley down there cowering saying that he is the guardian. So how does, how can Percy Bysshe Shelley be a, 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 this guardian that the Cyberman is looking for? Well, we'll, we'll find out. Um, the, the doctor uh, gets away from the Cyberman. Yeah. I have my, my, in my notes here, cyber poetry. Yes. <laughs> cyber poetry, the cyber slam. <laughs> so the, uh, the doctor says that history is vulnerable this night and implores them all to hide. And she's very scared here. I mean, she's mm -hmm. authentically worried. You know, this there is this, this is not a fixed moment in time. This is a vulnerable moment. And it's a, it's apparently a really vulnerable moment. One of the things that they do is so it it turns out just to kind of condense it a little yeah. bit. Um the there's a huge set of cyber wars in the future, and in the cyber wars, there was an artificial intelligence uh, apparently built out of a piece of uh, out of a little pool of mercury um, or quicksilver that yep. is known as the Siberium that directed the entire war for the Cybermen and that has all of their knowledge of their own future history. And hooking this up with information from Captain Jack, this the Alliance opposing the Cybermen was able to capture the plans to the Death Star, I mean the Siberium, <laughs> and transport it back in time um, where it ended up in the 1800s and uh, Shelley found it and it merged with him and now it's in his head, he's guarding it. That's the explanation for a lot of what's going on in the house, like when the vase got smashed. He was frustrated. He was in the house. Nobody could see him, and he, he was smashed invisible. the face. Right. But the Siberium has made him invisible, or at least has been making him invisible for purposes of concealing itself. And that, so that's a, an explanation of a lot of the ghostly phenomena we've been seeing, and including the perception filter that's making the, the house seem crooked to everybody. Right. Um, and, and so the doctor is uh, she gets telepathy you know, with him again she this, she, yeah. she she teeps him yeah to learn all this and so we see it through her mind's eye then the cyberman 
breaks through the perception filter and Percy sends him away. Right. But he he can't keep but the Siberium apparently is burning his neural cortex and it's going to kill him if it stays in him and he says he can't keep wishing the Cyberman into the cornfield for much longer and so uh, the doctor says then don't let right. him come and take the Siberium and and Yaz and Graham and Ryan are horrified because the one thing they know is do not give the lone Cyberman what it wants right. at all costs and so here we're up to the dilemma of if we uh, don't let the uh, the Cyberman take the Quicksilver, then um, Shelley's going to die. And Ryan makes the point, but it's one life against billions in these cyber wars. Yes. And the doctor says, yeah, but it's more than that because words matter. And if we let him die now, then um, your history is going to be changed and none of you will exist. Potentially, so, yeah. Well, it, she, I, I think it was more than potential the way she said it, but I could be mistaken. Yeah. And she says, so tell me now, do you, all of you, what do you want to do? Do you want your own histories wiped for this? And they're all silent. And the doctor has a speech that's a little over the top um, where she says, yeah, this team structure isn't always flat. Sometime it's, sometimes it's mountainous with me at the top of the mountain in the stratosphere, and I have to decide, and I either watch people burn now or later, and I can't win. Well, this, this is a moment that I really liked, actually. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the speech was a little bit <laughs> back to Time Lord Victorious a little bit. But, in fact, it really made the connection back to the, the, the 12th, I mean, the... Uh, the was the uh, Capaldi Smith and Tenet, 10, 11, and 12. It, the, it really felt like that doctor again, like those, those three incarnations of the mm -hmm. doctor where like we had this whole like, Oh, we're equal team, team TARDIS. Yay. And now it's like, no, when it comes down to it, she's the doctor, they're the companions. And when the hard choices have to be made, she's the one who makes it because a, she's a time Lord who has the knowledge and B you know, she sees from a perspective that yeah. they just can't. What what I I would have just changed. This is another where I think a dialogue fix would help because mm -hmm. she's the one who establishes the tone, and right. it's her that establishes this team has a flat structure. Yeah, and and so what and to have her then saying, "Oh yeah, it's actually not." It comes across as kind of arrogant. Yeah. What I would have done is say, have her say. I try to make this team have a flat structure, but sometimes it can't. Right. Well, she comes across as angry at them, which is yeah. in interesting. And and I, I I do like it when the doctor kind of makes us uncomfortable when she gets angry, or and he because in the past it's been the you know the other doctors have done this. They get angry at the companions, and we see the alienness of the doctor. The doctor looks human, acts kind of like just like a kooky person. But at times we really need to get that re reminder that the doctor is an alien and it w does not conform to all of our categories the way we think they necessarily should. Yeah, well, the hat wanting the hat gift was <laughs> enough for me this episode. <laughs> yeah. um, the but my larger point was that this is a much more fragile theory yeah. of how time works than we normally get on this show. Um, I mean, personally, I I think history is very fragile. Uh, if 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 we really could or someday can travel in time, I think the slightest thing that happens differently is going to completely change history. Right. I mean, just think about how if anything had gone differently on the night that you were conceived, your parents would have had a different child. You right. wouldn't exist. I mean, the slightest movement different and no Dom Bettinelli. And, Thanks for making me think of that. <laughs> and, and, well, it's true of all no, of us. It's true. And it's so true. Yeah, you, yeah. You change, I think you change anything in history. Wham, everyone you ever know is somebody else when you get back. Well, think about, yeah, if you go back uh, a million years, step on an ant, that ant doesn't get eaten by that creature, you know, the, the next thing up the food chain, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, and then something gets eaten when it shouldn't have, and suddenly all of history is different. You know, that's the butterfly effect it, right. you know, that we've and, talked and about. And I, I, I think in reality, history is highly prone to that. Yeah. But 
you can say, ah, you know, there's there's changes and then there's changes. And for the sake of fiction, we're not going to have the complete history rewrite time show. <laughs> right. And um, and so, you know, most of the time we don't have to constantly worry about stepping on. Actually, it was a butterfly in the sound of thunder. Yeah, that's right. Um, most of the time we don't have to worry about stepping on butterflies and things even out. Um, and, and that's fine as a fictional device. And then they can have their fixed points for no, sometimes things really must happen. And then it, they seem to imply there's something, it's kind of like a fixed point in, not that in that it will cause reality to fall apart if you try to change it, but it will radically rewrite the future at this moment. It's like mm. a nexus moment where history is vulnerable. And she and, sets it up early in this episode by saying, don't, don't mention the rules. Don't mention yeah. Frankenstein and all that sort of stuff. Right. Right. And this is, but this is a kind of different philosophy of time than we normally get. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to see happen, and it may take them a while to do it, I would like to to have them introduce this kind of vulnerable moment alongside fixed points. Yeah. Um, and that will let them have lighthearted episodes where we don't have to worry about stepping on butterflies, but then it'll also give us dramatic moments where we do have to worry about stepping on butterflies. Right, right. Uh, and and so in this moment where the, the doctor like says we have to save Shelley, the Cyberman comes back and it's Mary Shelley who confronts the Cyberman. And she says, you know, I still see a soul in there. You know, she sees the, the face and, you know, you spared my son and they hurt you, didn't you? This you, this modern Prometheus There's that term that we're going to get in relation to Frankenstein, the, the mm -hmm. Frankenstein's monster. Uh, you loved once and when loved in return, you did not wish to kill. And he's like, uh, no. <laughs> and he, he like he kind of leads her. You know, there's this moment where you just you think maybe she's right. And then, of course, he says no. And he mentions something about the res a resistance. Like, this yeah. is one of those times where I had trouble understanding all of the so, dialogue. So so what he says, she's she she finds out his name. Um, he remembers his name and his yep. name is Ashad. And he admits he was a father. And he did spare her son because your son was weak and useless. I <laughs> slit the throats of my own children when they joined the resistance. Right, right. That's what he says. Yes. Uh, yeah. Very, yeah, again, that horrible moment. So, and, again, you have this moment of hope followed yeah. by, oh, he takes it away. <laughs> right. And uh, the, the, the doctor realizes that Shelley would be transformed in death, that if he, if he, if, it's, if the Siberian Basically, thinks he's dead, it will yeah. leave him. Right. So that's the only way to get the Siberium out of Shelley is to, is is the Siberium needs to think he's dead. The Cyberman is happy to accomplish that by actually killing him. <laughs> right. But um, but the doctor doesn't want him dead because, you know, history, history. And and so she keeps him again. But this time she does something we've never seen before. She keeps him to imagine and experience the his own future death, which is not that far away. It's like eight years in the future. He, right. he died in uh, in or it's a little more than eight years, but he died in 18 uh uh, 22. 22. So it's only six years in the future. Yeah. He died uh, when he was 30 and he died by drowning. And so she lets him experience drowning yes. mentally now. And that convinces the Siberium to get out of him. And then the doctor starts to absorb the Siberium. Well, it uh -huh. should point out that the Siberium comes out and hovers between the, the Cyberman and the doctor, but won't go to the Cyberman. It it's not mm -hmm. like you would think it's wanting to go, but in this whole time, it's avoiding him for some reason, which isn't right. explained it, yet. It's hiding. It's being guarded from him. Yes. So very interesting that something has happened to this a cyber AI that doesn't a, want to be with him. It's a rogue AI. This is the Cyberman Skynet. Right. And so it enters into the doctor and um, the Cyberman then says, OK, I'll destroy Earth <laughs> if you don't give me. The Siberium. I'll punch a hole in the fabric of space and time on this planet if you don't give me the Siberium. And so uh, she does. 
you know, she she has no choice at this point. And now, and then he takes off with it, and she says, now, uh, like, oh, you, you must have a plan, they say to her. Yeah, the plan is, but step one was to give him the Siberium. Step two is, now go get it back. <laughs> Yeah, and so cr- clean up the mess I made in step one. Right, right, right. And so she, now she has to go to the future and stop him from rebuilding this cyber army with the Siberium. Uh, and in order to do that, they have to collect the information that Shelley still has in his head that the Siberium put there. Um, and so that's that's sort of the resolution. Then they they resolve. She's like, I'll drop you off on my way to the future. And the, the companions say, no, we're coming with you. This you know, this is what we do. We're not we're not staying behind. Um, and there's, uh, there's a couple more moments left in the episode as they're walking. Team TARDIS is walking back to the TARDIS. Uh, Graham says, the one thing I don't, rem- uh, I don't understand is, is where did the, the maid and the girl fit into all this <laughs> in, in the story? And the others like, are like, what maid and girl? <laughs> right. The, you know, the ones that were, that kind of snuck up on me in that room and the room got frigid and cold and they were kind of quiet and they're like, uh, I think those were not part of this. And they, they so he sort of realizes yeah. maybe they were real ghosts. Yeah. Early in the episode, the doctor sent flatly declares ghosts aren't real. And I'm going, actually, go listen to episode one of Jimmy <laughs> Egan's Mysterious World. <laughs> um, but then but then when uh, I mean, these ghosts were real enough, they brought him food. Yep. You know, and and given everything else, they were something. And Graham says, but ghosts don't exist. And the doctor walks her earlier statement back and says, unless they do, which is like, <laughs> OK, there's the doctor. I know, yeah, you know, exactly. not not totally dismissive of of weird stuff. Right. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, and I don't know. I'd love for them to pick up on that in the future and explain those. But they probably they yeah. may, they, they're likely not to. That's just a thread that's going to get left. Uh, then we have the the, the ending where. Uh, Byron is reading from his poem called Darkness, uh, which ends with, uh, and the clouds perished, darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. That's the actual uh, ending of mm-hmm. that poem. And it, apparently supposed to have been um, inspired, inspired by, by this, this moment. Or yeah. Mrs. Doctor, as everyone <laughs> keeps calling her in this episode, much to her annoyance. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so I, I, my I, I kind of want to give just my, my overall. Yeah. I would say this was very tightly written, maybe mm-hmm. a little too tight at, at times. Um, there was maybe a little too much gushing over Byron and Shelley at the beginning of the whole doctor. They were the most uh, important minds of the romantic era. As they, as there usually is. Yes. Thank you. I don't need informed attributes. I want <laughs> you to show me. Right. But I would say this finally felt like the doctor who, that I that I remember from previous doctors. This this episode, I I really like this. This may have been the best episode of the season for me. Um, hmm. It's certainly up there with Spyfall, uh, which I uh-huh. previously thought was the best episode of the season. I really like this. I still want a pure historical. That's my campaign. I'm never going to give that up. <laughs> uh, hmm. You can have ghosts in a pure historical, but I don't. But uh, you know, just no Cybermen. Big Finish has lots of them. Yep, yep. I don't. I don't. I'm going to be checking all those out. Uh, but uh, that's my assessment. Jimmy, what's your assessment? Well, a couple of things I didn't mention. I like when the perception filter vanishes it, it, after they've realized it's there, it's like gets disabled and comes back online and gets disabled. And so their environment keeps changing. Yep. Um, I like how there's a moment where the reason that Ashad can't kill the doctor straight away, which he tries to do is he, 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 the time jump took so much power out of his systems. He doesn't have any left for his weapon systems, but then there's a great moment where he recharges with a lightning bolt. Right. And that's very effective. Very Frankenstein. (laughs) Yes. Very Frankenstein. Although Mary is not there to see it in that scene. Yeah. Um, then there is, uh, my overall comment is I think this is the best Cyberman episode of New Who. Mm. Um, I I really liked um, Spyfall. Even more, I liked um, not uh, not Praxeus, but uh, oh, Fugitive of the Judoon. Oh yeah, yep. Um, Fugitive of the Judoon, I thought was awesome the way it ended. Um, and I I want to see what they do with it in the future. That may cause me to revise my opinion. But for me, thus far. Spyfall was really good with the new master. 
Fugitive of the June was really good with the new doctor. And this episode was really good with the lone Cyberman, who is the most effective portrayal of a Cyberman um, in New Who. Uh, I did not like it when they introduced the Cybermen in the David Tennant era. Mm -hmm. I have not liked subsequent appearances. The best of them is Rise of the Cybermen, um, or whatever the term is, uh, whatever the title is, at the end of Peter Capaldi's run. Right. Where you have the two-parter there, um, where the two Bill masters. gets turned into a Cyberman, yep. and you have the mo more Mondasian Cyberman back, so you have more of the body horror. Well, this gives us even more of the body horror with seeing half of the guy's face with all the cuts on it, and with him having emotions but still being sold on the cyber cause. This is the creepiest thing ever in New Who with Cyberman. Yep. Yeah, I agree. It's it's probably I'd say. It's much better than the uh, uh, the Danny Pink Cyberman stuff. Oh, uh, that, yeah. Ugh. That was might be the worst of the new Who. Uh, but yeah, this one, uh, it, and it, I have to say it was a surprise. I thought the haunting of Villa Diodati was just going to be a kind of a placeholder between you know, Praxeus and the two-part season finale. But this is essentially a three-part season finale yes. uh, that they surprised us with. I really am, am very happy with that. Uh, it's yeah, been really and, good. And so, some people s saw it coming because they said, well, we know Cybermen are showing up if by this finale. Right. And Frankenstein is kind of like the Cybermen. And so he was, uh, Chris Chibnall was actually asked in an interview if we were going to see the lone Cyberman in this episode. And he said he dodged it. He tried to say, well, there's this ghost story and blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> so he was trying to keep it secret that, no, this really is a three-part finale, and we just had the first part. Yeah, very well done, I, I have to say. It makes me hopeful for these last two episodes. Um, all right, so I think that about wraps it up for us. Uh, we, we've gone on, on enough there. Uh, I do want to take that uh, moment, as we always do, to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including this time Seth, Philip G, Ned G, Chris G, and James L. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who in all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. You heard what we think of the haunting of Villa Diodati. What do you think of it? Uh, was was it as good as we uh, as we said it was, uh, or did you have a different opinion? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn dot com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or by sending us an email to Doctor Who at sqpn dot com. And we'll be back next time when, of course, we'll be discussing Ascension of the Cybermen. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, head is fuzzy. Normal service should resume shortly. Right. This is going to be fun.